Hello, it's Eric from Strong Medicine, and today I'm discussing jaundice. The word jaundice comes from the French word jaune, which means yellow. So jaundice is a yellowish discoloration of the skin, sclera, and mucous membranes caused by an elevation in serum bilirubin, a yellow-orange bile pigment. Bilirubin is formed as a breakdown product of heme rings, usually from metabolized hemoglobin, as the result of either physiologic or pathophysiologic destruction of red blood cells. The location in the body where jaundice is first noticed is the eyes, which is called scleroicterus. This usually can be observed once the serum bilirubin level rises above 2.5 to 3 milligrams per deciliter. The point at which jaundice can be observed more generally depends upon the patient's skin tone and the ambient light. These videos are meant to focus on clinically relevant information but a brief review of the biochemistry of bilirubin will be necessary to understand both the diagnostic framework of jaundice as well as its workup. As mentioned, the first step in the development of bilirubin is the destruction of red blood cells, a process known as hemolysis, which releases hemoglobin and the heme groups at the center. Heme is first metabolized into something called biliverdin and from biliverdin into unconjugated bilirubin, both of these steps usually occur within macrophages of the reticuloendothelial system. Unconjugated bilirubin is transported to the liver in the blood, some of which is non-covalently bound to albumin. Once in the liver, it undergoes a process called conjugation, in which two molecules of glucuronic acid are covalently bound to it. This is an important step because conjugated bilirubin is much more soluble than the unconjugated form. Once conjugated, bilirubin is then excreted into the bile via hepatic ducts, which eventually drain into the duodenum via the common bile duct. Unconjugated bilirubin is often called indirect bilirubin, and conjugated bilirubin called direct bilirubin. These are not strictly synonyms, since the direct fraction includes both conjugated bilirubin as well as unconjugated bilirubin that is bound to albumin. However, they are quantitatively close enough to use interchangeably for routine clinical purposes. The simplest conceptual framework for jaundice puts etiologies into one of three categories based on where in the biochemical processes the problem lies. For example, pathology can be prehepatic, meaning hemolysis, in which there is an increased production of bilirubin. Pathology can be intrahepatic, almost always from intrinsic liver disease, or posthepatic, which is almost always from biliary obstruction. In these latter two categories, there's obviously a decreased clearance of bilirubin. Let's go through the framework in more detail, and as frameworks go, this is a big one. Increased production of bilirubin can be subdivided into intravascular hemolysis and extravascular hemolysis, including that which occurs within the reticuloendothelial system. Intravascular hemolysis includes a small collection of related diseases under the umbrella of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. This includes thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and hemolytic uremic syndrome. A rarer condition called paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, abbreviated PNH, also leads to intravascular hemolysis. Extravascular hemolysis can be due to an intrinsic red blood cell defect, such as those seen in the hereditary conditions G6PD deficiency, sickle cell disease, and various membrane defects. Extrinsic RBC defects include infections, which cause hemolysis, such as malaria and babesiosis, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and hypersplenism. Moving to conditions which decrease the clearance of bilirubin, intrahepatic etiologies can be subdivided into defects in transport and or conjugation, and intrahepatic cholestasis. In the first of these two categories are genetic diseases, of which Gobert syndrome is by far the most common. Gobert syndrome is a benign abnormality caused by a variety of defects affecting the activity of the enzyme responsible for the conjugation of bilirubin. It's typically an incidental finding on routine liver function tests when the unconjugated or indirect bilirubin level is mildly elevated while the remaining LFTs are normal. Jaundice in patients with Gobert syndrome may become evident during periods of stress, fasting, or illness. In addition to Gobert, a complication of heart failure called congestive hepatopathy can result in the elevation of bilirubin 
predominantly unconjugated bilirubin, in which the magnitude of elevation corresponds more to right atrial pressure than to cardiac output. Moving to the intrahepatic cholestasis category, the word cholestasis means stagnation or impairment of normal bile flow. Many conditions can lead to cholestasis. Within the liver, these include any form of hepatitis, any form of cirrhosis, the distinct diagnosis of primary biliary cirrhosis, infiltrative diseases such as lymphoma and amyloidosis, a condition called cholestasis of pregnancy, and the use of total parenteral nutrition. The typical term used for post-hepatic decreased bilirubin clearance is extrahepatic cholestasis. Here we find stones in the common bile duct known as cholidocolithiasis, infection of the bile ducts known as cholangitis, malignancy, specifically cholangiocarcinoma and pancreatic cancer, strictures, including those seen with chronic pancreatitis, and parasitic infections, specifically ascaris. In addition, there are several conditions with roughly equal predilection for the intra- and extrahepatic biliary ducts. These are liver fluke infections, primary sclerosing cholangitis, and AIDS cholangiopathy. And finally, are jaundice mimics. This includes anything which turns the skin yellow without an abnormal bilirubin level. The most notable condition here is keratinemia, caused by the prolonged excessive consumption of carotene-rich foods, such as carrots and sweet potatoes, most often seen in young children. In the United States, the most common causes of acute jaundice include Gilbert syndrome, alcoholic and viral hepatitis, and cholidocolithiasis. The most common causes of chronic progressive jaundice in the U.S. are cirrhosis and pancreatic cancer. Notably, this framework leaves out or de-emphasizes the causes of jaundice in neonates and infants, which deserves its own separate framework and discussion. When taking the history of a patient presenting with jaundice, you want to obviously ask about its chronology, how long has it been present, and is it episodic or constant? What associated symptoms are present? The most relevant to ask specifically about include abdominal pain and distension, clay-colored stools known as acolic stools, which are caused by a lack of bilirubin breakdown products in the stool, leg edema, pruritus, weight gain or loss, and fever. Components of the past medical history that are particularly relevant include any hematologic, liver, biliary, pancreatic, or cardiac disease, as well as HIV. There are many medications, supplements, and herbal products associated with jaundice, particularly via the mechanism of drug-induced hepatitis. Alcohol and illicit drug history, especially IV drugs. Take a good sexual history. And travel history is particularly important for this symptom as well. Moving to the exam after vitals, a focused exam should include a full abdominal exam, including an assessment for splenomegaly, a cardiac exam, including a JVP, an extremity exam looking for edema, and a skin exam predominantly looking for signs of liver disease. Key labs for all patients with jaundice include a CBC, basic metabolic panel, LFTs, and an INR. If the AST and ALT are elevated, a hepatitis panel, plus or minus acetaminophen level, depending on the confirmed chronicity of the jaundice. If unconjugated bilirubin is predominant, also consider a reticulocyte count, LDH, haptoglobin, Coombs test, and blood smear, particularly if the history is not consistent with Gobert. The pattern of the results from these blood tests usually fall cleanly into one of four categories. Predominantly increased unconjugated bilirubin with or without a decrease in hemoglobin, an increase in both conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin, combined with a significant increase in AST and ALT, an increase in both forms of bilirubin, as well as an increase in INR, decrease in albumin, and decrease in platelets, or a predominantly increased conjugated bilirubin and alkaline phosphatase. Let's go through the next steps for each pattern. In the first scenario, consider whether the patient has a history of recurrent and self-limited jaundice during times of stress. If so, it's probably Gobert syndrome and additional workup is usually not necessary. If no, 
Consider whether there is evidence of hemolytic anemia, such as a low hemoglobin, high retic count and retic index, high LDH, and or low haptoglobin. If a sufficient combination of those findings is present, work the patient up for hemolytic anemia, starting with a blood smear and Coombs test, if not already performed. If those findings of a hemolytic anemia are not present, consider whether this could be the first presentation of a patient with Gobert syndrome, or an atypical presentation of a disease usually associated with an increase in both unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin. In scenario two, when both bilirubins are elevated, along with AST and ALT, that's suggestive of acute or subacute hepatocellular disease, meaning hepatitis. Work up here should include viral hepatitis serologies, an acetaminophen level, even if the patient denies a history of acetaminophen use, a pregnancy test, and abdominal imaging, which can usually be a right upper quadrant ultrasound. One can consider a workup for rarer causes of hepatitis, such as autoimmune hepatitis, particularly if the patient is without a recent history of heavy alcohol use. In the next scenario, when both bilirubins are elevated, but the other most prominent abnormalities are a high INR, a low albumin, and low platelets, this suggests cirrhosis. In the patient whose cirrhosis is severe enough to be causing jaundice, there are almost always other physical findings consistent with the diagnosis that are observable, such as ascites, lower extremity edema, spider angiomas, palmar erythema, and asterixis, among many others. Additional diagnostic testing should include hepatitis serologies and an iron panel to screen for hemochromatosis, abdominal imaging in which a right upper quadrant ultrasound is once again usually sufficient, and as with hepatitis, consider a workup for rarer causes of cirrhosis. And the last scenario, in which the most prominent lab abnormalities are an elevated conjugated bilirubin and elevated alkaline phosphatase, that's indicative of probable biliary obstruction, which in Western countries is most often the consequence of malignancy. So therefore, the test of choice here is some form of abdominal imaging. The specific choice is going to depend on a number of factors, including relative costs and availability of each, and what specific diagnoses are near the top of the differential diagnosis for the patient. For example, where I practice, CT and ultrasounds are equally available, and the most likely diagnosis of a patient with this combination of lab tests is probably pancreatic cancer, which is much better visualized via CT. So abdominal CT is what I would order for an initial radiographic test in almost all patients I see. But for a different population in a different clinical setting, an ultrasound might be the better call. If CT or ultrasound confirm obstruction but is unable to identify the specific cause, either an ERCP or MRCP, which best visualize the biliary tree, is often done as the next step at institutions where these are available. Key takeaway points for this video. Jaundice is a yellowish discoloration of the skin, eyes, and mucous membranes caused by an elevation of serum bilirubin. There are two primary forms of bilirubin, unconjugated, also known as indirect, and conjugated, also known as direct. The primary etiologies of an isolated increase in unconjugated bilirubin are hemolysis from any cause and Gobera syndrome, a common enzyme defect without significant clinical consequences. The primary etiologies of increased conjugated bilirubin can be classified as intrahepatic, such as seen from cirrhosis and hepatitis, and post-hepatic, such as from biliary obstruction. New onset jaundice in adult without other symptoms and signs should prompt investigation for a pancreatic or biliary malignancy.